The following program is classified M. It is recommended for viewers 15 years and over. We recommend the use of the parental lock system. This is Regime in southern China. On an evening in October 1934, a column of 86,000 soldiers, their followers and supporters, set off silently from this town. Most of them were notified of the move without knowing where they were going. The people who saw them off thought that they would soon return, but they did not. In October 1935, one year after they left Regime, the bedraggled, beaten up remnants of that army arrived in northern Shanxi, with only 7,000 soldiers left. In October 1936, other fronts of the Red Army, including the first, second and fourth fronts, the 25th Corps and the Shangxi Gansu Red Army arrived successively. Originally numbering over 200,000, they brought the total to just 36,000 soldiers and established the garrison that would be a starting point for the war against the Japanese invasion. That trek by the Red Army has become known as the Long March. These men and women experienced harrowing escapes from death. They were not afraid to die, but the spirit of life was fierce in each of them. Chan 不怕任何艰难险阻，不惜付出一切牺牲的精神，就是坚持独立自主，实事求是，一切从实际出发的精神，就是顾全大局，严守纪律，紧密团结的精神。Every country identifies itself, its values, its character, through stories from its past. China recognizes and celebrates a long imperial past, which collapsed early in the 20th century, to be replaced by warlordism and imperialist aggression. Out of the turmoil came something which everyone calls New China. And the spirit, values, character of New China rest on a single story, the story of the Long March. In this school, in schools like this all over China, children learn the story of the Long March. They learn it and they recite it. The Long March is a piece of history that took place in remote southern China more than 80 years ago. But it is something more the Chinese people see themselves and their aspirations reflected in what Mao Zedong, who rose to the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party during the Long March, called the Great Strategic Shift. In the months before the Long March, the world was still stumbling out of the Great Depression. Adolf Hitler became the undisputed dictator of Germany. People were not sure about Mussolini, 
who would invade Abyssinia within the year. The Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin was, in Winston Churchill's words, a riddle wrapped in an enigma. What was happening in China following Japan's invasion of the northeastern region in 1931 resonates to this day. It was in this climate of uncertainty that the Red Army started the Long March. Dotted around China are pieces of monumental statuary that tell the story of the Long March, or at least try to capture the ideals and the spirit of the marches. Before we tell their story, we must journey back to the time before they set off to explore the reasons why they were forced to march. In 1911, the last imperial dynasty of China, the feudal Qing Empire, collapsed. Under its misrule, the Chinese people were humiliated by military defeats and unequal treaties that forced concessions and territory to be yielded without just payment. The infant republic that replaced thousands of years of dynastic rule struggled from the start against factional warlordism. After the First World War, it was further challenged by the peacemakers at Versailles, who despite the efforts and sacrifice of the Chinese Labour Corps on behalf of the Allies, gave German colonial territory in China, not back to the Chinese, but to Japan. The impotence of the Republic in face of this action, widely interpreted as an insult, brought demonstrations onto the streets and turned many young activists away from the Republican idea towards more meaty options, towards the recent revolution in Russia, for example. One of those who turned to the Marxist idea was an assistant librarian at Peking University. His name was Mao Zedong. He will, of course, figure prominently in our story. Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the first provisional president of the Republic of China, shouldered the responsibilities for ending chaos and governing the country. Recognized as the founding father of China's democratic revolution, Sun died in 1925. He was not yet 60. History, of course, turns on such moments. The man who emerged to assume the leadership of the nationalist Kuomintang was Chen Kai-shek, who came not from the political, but from the military wing. China was torn apart by warlords at that time. To end the turbulent situation, Chiang Kai-shek joined forces with the Communist Party to launch the Northern Expedition. As the two parties marched to occupy more than half of China, disagreements arose between them. The Communist Party, which represented the interests of the bottom, the large agricultural population of 400 million, advocated redistribution of the land under the banner, overthrowing the local despots and distributing land. Most of the officers of Cheng's Kuomintang were landowners, which meant that cooperation between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party was doomed. Chiang Kai-shek parted company with his United Front partners, initiating the purge of the Communist Party known as the April 12th Incident. Sun Yat-sen's widow branded Cheng a traitor to Sun's ideals of three people's principles, of nationalism, democracy, the people's livelihood. Cheng did not relent. After Japan invaded Northeast China, the Communist Party declared war against the invader, but Chiang Kai-shek implemented a policy of non-resistance. The revolutionary and communist death toll that resulted from his actions was 300,000. In view of the purge, the Communist Party held armed uprisings 
and established an independent people's army. Then it withdrew to rural areas where the Kuomintang's influence was weak. In these areas, it established bases or Soviets. The Central Revolutionary Base was formed in parts of Jiangxi and Fujian, a rallying point for those who had always been the nobodies of a feudal system. Here, as an important leader of the Chinese Communist Party, the interim government of the Chinese Soviet Republic and the Chinese Workers and Peasants Red Army, Mao Zedong moves to the center of our story. The well-equipped, well-supplied, numerically far superior nationalist military had contained communist influence to rural areas where it was dependent on the peasants. But in the first decades of the 20th century, peasants comprised the vast majority of the Chinese population. That was going to be important in the struggle ahead. Starting in November 1930, Chiang Kai-shek launched a series of campaigns to encircle and strangle the revolutionary bases under the leadership of the Communist Party. Under the command of Mao Zedong and Zhu Da, the Red Army won the first three encirclement campaigns. They won the fourth under Chou Enlai and Judah's command, following Mao's strategy and tactics. Then Cheng hired General Hans von Sieg, who had led the German general staff immediately after the Great War. And the tactics that von Sieg introduced changed things. Von Sieg preached tightening the noose on the areas of communist control through the construction of thousands of blockhouses. Some lumps of concrete remain. Chen called the communists bandits, and the encirclements he called bandit extermination campaigns. Mao Zedong, who was called a rural Marxist by leaders like Bo Gu, head of the Central Committee, who had studied in the Soviet Union, had by now been sidelined. Bo Gu, appointed his own German military advisor, Otto Braun. The Chinese called him Li De, and these two men would be in command during the Fifth Encirclement campaign. Li had no knowledge of the Chinese language and little interest in Chinese affairs. It turned out that he wasn't much of a soldier either. His disastrous decisions would set the stage for the long march. Hold high the Soviet banner, exhorted Bo Gu and leader. We must win the final victory. But instead of victory, the Red Army was stuck in trenches for a year, battering uselessly against 3,000 turtle shell forts, linked by a network of roads. Resupply was not possible. Even the salt supply had been cut. <laughs> Chiang 
Cho Enlai, a figure who would share the government of the People's Republic through the middle years of the 20th century, wrote from inside the Jiangxi Soviet, the plan by the enemy is different from the previous four campaigns. It is a strategic step in their penetration into the heart of the Soviet base. In September 1933, the Kuomintang assembled a million troops, including half a million to attack the Central Revolutionary Base, and launched the Fifth Encirclement Campaign against the revolutionary bases in an attempt to wipe out the Communist Party and the Red Army. The Kuomintang army, approaching regime in steady stages, threatened to overwhelm the Soviet. In May 1934, the Central Committee agreed that their best option was a breakout and march to Western Hunan to link up with the Red Army based there. In a telegram sent on June 25, the Comintern agreed to the plan. The final decision was made three months later. Mao did not learn of it until then. The breakout became a heroic epic of endurance, ideal, and belief. An epic that has been recreated in many film and television dramas. From headquarters in Beijing, a memo went out to all the counties in the Central Revolutionary Base for 200,000 pairs of extra thick straw sandals and 100,000 rice pouches. They had to be delivered to the Red Army by early October. The date for departure had been set for the 10th. Wei Guolu, who would travel the whole of the Long March as Chou Enlai's bodyguard, remembered the panic of preparations. I discovered that in every section of general headquarters, documents were being burned late into the night. Vice Chairman called me into his office and said we were to get ready to leave. He said that we would be marching a long way. Xiao Feng was another who marched the whole way. He remembered. The political instructor of each unit gave his men a pep talk. Don't think we are leaving the base area never to return, Feng remembered the instructor saying. We will come back. We definitely will. He was, said Feng, cut short by a bugle signaling the start of the march. When that bugle sounded on October 10th, 1934, the force, 86,000 strong, broke through the nationalist lines at their weakest point and began its trek and our story. <laughs> The Central Army set out in waves over the next few days. Yang Silu was one of them.
Wawu is a village in Rejin, Jiangxi province. There were 43 households in Wawu. From them came 17 young men who all joined the Red Army. Before leaving, they planted 17 trees. The trees have grown tall, but none of those who planted them ever returned to Wawu. <laughs> A rear guard of combat troops and the sick and wounded, some 20,000 strong, was left to delay the pursuit. Amongst them was Mao Zitan, Mao Zedong's younger brother, who was killed in the fighting. He was not the only one of Mao's relations to stay behind. As the march started, her Zixin, Mao's third wife, handed over her two-year-old son. You're going with auntie and uncle for a while, she said, and turned and walked away. Her Zixin had already lost one child. She was pregnant and the march would be a terrible trial, as we will learn. She never saw her son again. Mao's wife was one of over 30 women who set out on the long march. Kung Keqing, wife of Judah, one of the Red Army's great commanders, marched. She recalled a bright moon to light the way. I usually carry three or four rifles, she said, to encourage the others because the wife of the commander-in-chief should always be a model for others to follow. From vanguard to last to leave, the army stretched for many kilometers in a U formation, with headquarters, political headquarters, communications, supply and medical units marching in the belly of the U, combat troops forming the wings. Chen Chongfeng, Mao Zedong's bodyguard throughout the march, noted that the chairman did not take his nine compartment knapsack with him. His entire equipment consisted of two blankets, a cotton sheet, an oil cloth, a worn overcoat, a broken umbrella, and a bundle of books. The marchers did not know where they were going, nor for how long or how far. They took with them silver coins, printing presses, sewing machines, costumes for plays, pots, pans, and an x-ray machine. Not everything arrived at journey's end, and of those who set out, only 10% would reach their destination. As soon as they set out, the column came under air attack. The nationalists owned the skies, so that for almost the whole time that the Red Army was on the march, it was bombed and strafed from the air. It took the Central Red Army over a month to force a way through the enemy's three blockade lines and reach the Xianjiang River. And there, disaster awaited the marchers. As soon as the enemy realized the purpose of our move, they built up a cordon on the Xinjiang River called Li Tianyu, an eyewitness to what happened. The Guixi and Hunan troops attacked our flanks. The Kuomintang Central Army and Kuantan forces our rear. This is how the slaughter was recreated in a Chinese feature film. 
It shows what Li Tianyu remembered. The situation was critical, he said. Our only way was to force a crossing of the river as quickly as possible. Close to the site of the Battle of the Xinjiang River stands a revolutionary memorial. And here, 25,000 Red Army soldiers are buried. During five days from November 27th until December 1st, 1934, the Long March was decimated. More than half of the 86,000 troops were lost in this one action. Of the 11,000 men of 8th Corps, only 600 made it across the river. A survivor described the scene to the writer Sun Shu Yun. Oh, chaos, chaos everywhere, he said. The worst was the bombers. They turned the sky black. Cheng had at least 200 planes. After the bombing, the eyewitness continued, came wave after wave of enemy troops. They fought ferociously hand to hand. The soldiers stood there, shocked by the color of the river and the bodies floating on the water. I had to use my hands to push bodies aside to swim across the river. The 34th Division was deployed to cover the river crossing. They were besieged and destroyed. Their commander, Chen Chu Xiang, wounded and captured, committed suicide by ripping his intestines from the wound. He was 29 years old. It was, Mao said, our worst period. Blocked in front, and pursued from behind. No one is quite sure how many films, television dramas and documentaries telling the story of the march have been made since the People's Republic of China was founded. They are still being made and books are being written. The current estimate is two and a half thousand titles. And this is the start of the march in perhaps its most epic, most theatrical rendition. A song cycle here in a performance from more than 50 years ago by the Janyo Art Troupe of the People's Liberation Army. In October 1934, the Swiss missionary Rudolf Boshardt ran into the 6th Corps Red Army in Wanping, Quechou Province. He marched with the army through western Hunan and Quechou for 560 days. After returning to Europe, he wrote his memoirs, The Restraining Hand, the first book about the Long March written by a non-Chinese. The Reds do not force coolies into their service, so they told us we might find our own for carrying. And off Bosshart went. A conservative estimate of our wanderings is 6,000 miles, and we were billeted in over 300 houses, he reported. And he stressed that the leaders are convinced communists, disciples of Marx and Lenin, and do what they do from principle. Those leaders were young. The average age of commanders on the Long March was mid-twenties. These were the men who had to pick up the pieces after the crossing of the Xiangxiang that had cost so much in men and material. Mao Zedong summarized the problem very simply. The primary problem, and a serious one too, is how to conserve our strength and await an opportunity to defeat the enemy. 
The ruinous battle at the Xiangxiang River, as we shall see, paved the way for Mao's return to power. When the Red Army found its path towards Western Hunan Revolutionary Base, blocked by a massive nationalist troop concentration, it was Mao Zedong who proposed that the Central Red Army wheel towards Guizhou, a move which possibly saved them from extermination. Mao had his own ideas about how to defeat the enemy and would promote them when the march paused in a town where a meeting took place whose effect can hardly be exaggerated. In a way, in the story of the Long March, the talking that shaped policy in conferences and meetings has had a more enduring effect than the walking. That is certainly true of what happened in the town of Sunyi. The guidance coming from Moscow for the Chinese Communist Party was often unrelated to the reality of China, which meant that the party had to develop its own policies and practices. The march from the crossing of the Xinjiang to Sunyi had been punctuated by central committee meetings in Tongdao, Liping and Ho Chung, at which party leaders debated their next move. But what happened in Sunyi is a keystone in the story of the Long March and one of the most important turning points in the history of the Chinese Revolution which is why the two-story wood and brick building at number 80, Honsi Road, has been so carefully restored. It was the beginning of 1935. Wang Chichong recalled, I received a phone call from Li Ya Lao, the divisional political commissar. The 4th Regiment has broken through the Kuomintang defences, he said. Take the 6th Regiment across the river, march towards Sunyi, and take it by storm. Li Ya Lao himself remembered, my instructions had been to take Sunyi by surprise and arouse the masses. The Red Army soldiers, disguised as retreating Kuomintang, made guards open the town gate. Wang Si Chong said, Without firing a shot, our men rushed through the gateway like a flood. On the morning of January 7th, we declared Sunyi liberated. During the days, a mood of celebration lingered over the town. The warlords had been chased away. Propaganda drummed up a storm of support and a volunteering for the Red Army. Chou Enlai's bodyguard remembered going to Zunyi, then the second largest city in Guizhou province. There was, he said, a constant fall of mist-like rain, bearing out the saying, there are not three clear days in a row in Quecho, and no three li are flat, and no three coins in anyone's pocket. He recalled, our proud force entered the city in well-ordered ranks, singing a militant song. It was in Sunyi that some of the soldiers, this was after all a substantially peasant army, saw light bulbs for the first time. They did not know that the lights could be switched off and assumed that the bulbs would dim as the sun went down.
定要滑。The purpose of the Sunni conference, held from the 15th of January, was to review what had led to the withdrawal of the Central Revolutionary Base, what had caused the disaster at the beginning of the Long March, and what should be changed. The conference went on for three evenings. Its effect was to resolve the most pressing problems facing the Communist Party, endorse the removal of Bogu and Li De from the leadership of the party, elevate Mao Zedong into the leadership which at a critical moment probably saved the party, the Red Army, and the revolution. Bo Gu spoke first. He tried to attribute the failure of the Red Army to the strong enemy. Chou Enlai, speaking second, summed up the experiences and lessons of the fifth anti-encirclement campaign. Zhang Wenchen spoke next, criticizing Bo Gu and Li De for their mistakes in military command. Be stern in the council chamber so that you may control the situation, wrote Sun Tzu two and a half thousand years ago. Well, Mao did that. He censured Bo Gu and Li De for their mistakes in military command. As Mao spoke, Wu Xiuqin, Li De's interpreter, kept up the translation, and Li, according to an eyewitness, turned white when Mao began to attack him. At no point, according to the witness, did he lose control, but he smoked cigarette after cigarette. Wang Jiaxiong spoke after Mao, and in unequivocal support of what had been said, his was, Mao would say, the crucial ballot. With Li De and Bo Gu blamed for the disasters, control of the Red Army passed to Mao Zedong, Zhang Wenchen, Zhu De, and Chou Enlai. Like the season of spring, remembered Chang Nanchung, who was on the march, the Sunyi conference brought new hope and inspiration to the whole army. It also brought Mao Zedong to unchallenged leadership of the party, a position he would hold until his death. By his side would be Zhou Enlai. The two men were quite different, which perhaps explains their decades-long partnership. Mao, from a peasant background, had never been out of China. Zhou Enlai, five years younger, had been to Japan and Europe. They ruled China as chairman and premier for 30 years and died within a few months of each other. They would be followed by Dong Xiaoping. In the early days of the Long March, Deng was responsible for the military newspaper, The Red Star. After the Leaping Conference, he served as secretary general of the CPC Central Committee. Yes, uh... Mao later explained the importance of the Sunyi conference to visiting dignitaries. We spent dozens of years getting to know China, he said. But not until the Sunyi conference did we understand independence? As the Sunyi conference deliberated, Cheng's troops and local warlords had been advancing towards the city. Mao moved to implement the new tactics that would give the Long March its character, tactics that were to be mobile and flexible. Defend in order to attack, retreat in order to advance, 
move against the flanks in order to move against the front, and take a roundabout route in order to get on a more direct route. The march was to head north, cross the Yangtze River, join forces with the 4th Red Army, and establish a new base area in either western or northwestern Sichuan province. And so they moved from Sunyi, aiming to cross China's greatest river, the Yangtze. But several days after resuming its trek, the Red Army faced the troops of the Kuomintang Army outside the town of Tuchang. It was an unexpectedly costly battle. Thousands of Red Army soldiers lie at the site of the Battle of Tuchang. Their names are known. As a Chinese expression has it, they are nameless, like the flowers that cover the mountain. The check at Tuchang forced the Red Army to change course. To try and throw off the Kuomintang pursuit, the march turned west. They would reach the Chushue River in what Mao considered his best campaign. They were to cross four times. The first time to get away, and the second when an intercepted telegram told them that Sun Yi, which they had just left, was the weakest point in the Nationalist Cordon, to double back on the town. In their path, 40 kilometers from Sun Yi, was one of the places that has been engraved into the folklore of the Long March, Loshan Pass. At an altitude of 1,400 meters, local wisdom has it that the pass, if defended by one man, could withstand assault by 10,000. The Red Army's attack went in on February 25, 1935. Mao Zedong anticipated what was to come in one of his best-known poems. Do not say that the strong pass is guarded with iron, he wrote. This very day, in one step, we shall pass its summit. And they did. The 13th Regiment of the Red Army launched the assault. Loshan Pass and nearby Mount Dianjin were quickly seized. Mao Zedong wrote of the idle boast of the strong pass and of bugles sobbing low. The Red Army moved on to capture Sun Yi again their first big victory since the beginning of the march. Two of Chiang Kai-shek's divisions and eight regiments were destroyed, and about 100,000 rounds of ammunition seized. But at a cost, 27-year-old Dong Ping, the chief of staff of the Central Red Army and most senior Red Army commander, was killed. This is him, and behind him one of his comrades in a granite memorial on the scene of his sacrifice. Mao's success brought Kuomintang forces to the area in strength, and Chiang Kai-shek arrived to take charge of, as he put it, avenging the disgrace. Mao turned to take advantage of the enemy's plan. On March 16th, crossing the Chushue River for the third time. Cheng reacted to the crossing by switching his forces to meet the communists at the Yangtze, which he deduced was their destination. Instead, the Central Army turned and crossed the Chushue for the fourth and final time on March 21st, marching between nationalist army formations and turning towards Guiyang. Cheng reacted, ordering his forces to meet the enemy there. The enemy did not oblige. Mao ordered a change of course and a forced march to Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province. Crossing the river four times during the three months of campaigning, 
gave the Red Army the initiative. The memorial to the crossing is suitably called the Memorial Hall of the Four Chushue River Crossings. As Cheng began to assemble his troops in Kunming, the Red Army turned north to a crossing not of the Yangtze, but one of its tributaries, the Jingsha Zhong, or Golden Sands River. The army divided into columns and moved to Jingsha Zhong. The air was heavy with the smell of tobacco, recalled Xiao Ying Tong. The regimental commander turning towards us said, our regiment has been assigned the task of capturing the ferry. So they captured six ferries, and for seven days and nights starting on May 3rd, they shuttled across the Jin Zhong. General Liu Bocheng directed the operation from this rock, now known predictably as the General's Rock. No one was lost during the exercise. The Chushue battles lasted for three months. By now, the Red Army had fought over thousands of kilometers, shaken off the chasing Kuomintang army, and overturned the most dangerous situation they had faced since the start of the Long March. Mao said that the four crossings of the Chushue River were his proudest military accomplishment on the march. They made up songs about every episode. There is an opera that celebrates the Jincha achievement and a song of the victorious Jincha crossing. Mao's tactics had seen the Central Red Army escape the odds stacked against them, but success was far from assured. Entering Sichuan province, they faced another fast, wide and deep river, the Dadu. Flanked by sheer cliffs, their only way across was an ancient chain bridge. No part of the Long March story has been more recited, painted, sung about, than what happened when the Red Army reached the Dadu River and the perilous Luding Bridge. Would Mao lead the army across the river safely? Where would he lead them to? But the battles ahead, like Luding Bridge, were not to be the greatest killer. It is hunger, cold and unbelievably harsh country that awaits when we continue the story of the Long March.